All right, so we are uh, a minute past our official start time. Um, so let's get going. Uh, I know people will still be joining, but um, really excited uh, to be moderating this session today. I'm John Chmea. I'm the VP of Circularity and Senior Analyst here at GreenBiz. Um, so this topic on the intersection of sustainability and battery technology is uh, near and dear to my heart as an EV driver myself, a recovering electrochemist and a circularity uh, enthusiast. So really excited to dig into this topic today. A couple quick uh, housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, this session is being recorded. Recordings will be available uh, very soon on our replay section of Hopin. Uh, and a lot of them will also be available on our YouTube channel um, within a couple of weeks. Uh, please use the chat box or the Q&A with any questions you have. Uh, feel free to put in the chat where you're joining us from so we know sort of what kind of audience we have here. Um, and then before you leave the session at the end, please take the survey on the right hand of the uh, chat box that helps us um, determine what topics everybody is enjoying here at the conference and, and what to keep focusing on in the future. So um, just by way of sort of queuing up this topic, uh, I found a, a, an actually very recent uh, good uh, Fast Company article on lithium ion batteries. Um, and it basically, you know, between 2000 and 2018, the number of lithium ion batteries manufactured globally uh, was multiplied by 80. Uh, in 2018, 66% of them were used in electric vehicles. And uh, the planned development of electric mo mobility will increase demand for uh, batteries, as we know. We've got three folks here on this session today who are very well positioned to talk about the future of batteries and the future of battery sustainability. Um, and I'm just going to let them introduce themselves because they can do it much better than I can. So let's start with uh, Emma uh, Nirenheim from Northvolt. Hi, everyone. So my name is Emma Nirenheim. Uh, I work as a chief environmental officer at Northvolt. So uh, yeah, I'm in the, the management board and I've been since five years. Uh, I'm responsible for anything from sustainability across supply chain to sustainability strategies. And then we also run a business unit that is a company itself, actually, in the family called Revolt, which is the recycling uh, unit of Northvolt. So we just take batteries back. And in my history, I've been a professor, full professor in environmental engineering, and I spent some time with this also. Great. And Len, let's go over to Grant, because I see he's already off mute. Grant Ray from Group 14, Group 14 Technologies. I almost said hey, four. So I'm the VP of Global Market Strategy. Um, for Group 14, we deal with lithium silicon battery materials um, and just helping transform traditional lithium ion batteries into that kind of next stage of you know, really going after battery density, fast charging, and being able to meet the demand of electrification that's coming. Um, so historically, I come from automotive. I've been helping bring products and, and technologies to, to market across anything from classic four-wheeled and two-wheeled vehicles to flying vehicles and um, even uh, just uh, power prosthetics and whatnot. And I think what really excited me about the, the battery space is that it, it really is the thing that powers everything when we start to look at where we're going in the 21st century. And I'm, I'm just really excited to be, uh, to be here to talk about you know, what that means as we start to go through that transition and what some of the challenges are. Great, thanks Grant. And last but not least, uh, Asim Hussein from QuantumScape. Hi, I'm the Asim Hussein. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at uh, QuantumScape. Uh, we are a company focused on making um, solid state lithium metal batteries. So sort of the next generation of lithium ion batteries using a uh, technology that uh, essentially has a solid state separator in the battery and allows lithium to plate um, as a solid in terms of the anode. So that dramatically shrinks the size of the battery because you don't have an anode material or graphite on the anode aspect. It's not a hosted anode, it forms in situ. Um, and most importantly, what that enables us to do is uh, dramatically increase energy density. So essentially, 
increase the range of cars dramatically if you use the same amount of volume of space in the vehicle or in fact if you want to use less um, battery but still get the same range as well as um, dramatically uh, uh, you know reduce the charging time to the 15 minute level mark and get closer to the gas station experience um, and uh, I come from a background of clean tech, sort of full circle here, where I started working on the grid at the first part of my career, grid efficiency um, and future proofing to working on distributed generation, working with fuel cells. And we had solid oxide fuel cells. And then my career followed solid state separators. So here I am now on solid state batteries um, as a next step. So. Very cool. Thanks, everybody, for sharing your background. Uh, we had a very early question. Uh, can, can we define circularity? I'll just do that very quickly. Uh, it's another term for circular economy. So basically changing from our extractive and wasteful linear economy where we take things out of the ground, make products, and ultimately they get disposed of to keeping those materials uh, in circulation longer through recycling, recovery, remanufacturing, repurposing, all the, all the R's. Um, so that's a, just a quick definition of circularity. Also, one more quick thing here. We do have a poll open um, asking folks what the biggest barrier they think uh, is to EV adoption. Um, so feel free to answer that poll and we'll get back to it later. Um, so this can be a question for everybody and maybe we'll, maybe we'll just start with Emma again. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the current battery landscape and sort of what needs to be improved? What, what would you consider makes it sort of more unsustainable at this moment? Uh, where are the opportunities for improvement in batteries? I mean, we see a lot of opportunities. And um, when we started, it started off with a little, okay, so when we started Norfolk, we, we understood that in Europe, where we had basically no supply chain for EVs, uh, the main challenge for importing the batteries, especially from Asia at the time, was that it came with a significant footprint and it was far from circular. And it created dependencies on a supply chain where we had very little impact. So a very early definition of who we would be uh, was to make sure that not only us as Northfold, but the entire market of battery manufacturing when it was built in our part of the world needed to be more sustainable, especially after diesel gate and so on. And in this landscape, I mean, we are just still in the beginning of a journey where this entire market will be built up. Uh, we still have, um, uh, we still is in the beginning of what we call the hockey stick for beginning manufacturing, especially in Europe, but I think also in the US. And when this manufacturing landscape is growing, uh, which it is starting to do in the industrial space right now. Uh, that circularity and the sustainability, we talk about our two cornerstones, which is uh, carbon footprint and, and recycling, but it will, that will be more diverse as we, as we go. I think that's going to be the key. That's going to be what's bringing the trust to the communities and, uh, and to also bring a new kind of supply chain. We already see conventional companies here in, um, uh, in Europe starting to transform and becoming interested in this. We have an example where we work together with a forest company, Storenzo, where they went into the graphite industry and started looking at a, a new graphite product from, from wood lignin. And all this together is going to be sort of merged into what I think is going to be a perfect combination of Asian technology, the sort of startup community where U.S. In, uh, come from, and, and then also the sort of optimizing the process industry and getting into something that has the tradition of becoming sustainable um, and, and, and uh, product and production oriented. I think that's going to be super interesting going forward. Definitely. Uh, awesome. Grant, any, any? Well, I think what Emma was talking about in terms of the challenges for um, logistics and where things are produced is, uh, is going to be really, really important. It already is. Um, we tend to take a, our, our process innovation as much as we consider material innovation. 
So in the same way that we focus on uh, silicon carbon materials, we also focus on how that's produced to be able to deliver basically plug and play factories anywhere in the world. So we're not looking at a, you know, a single uh, basically gate for delivery to the, to the, the world's needs for, for batteries, which you know, if you look at, at graphite, it comes from China, Japan. And if you've got any other major logistics challenge, you know, another round of COVID, whatever it may be, it doesn't matter where your battery factory is, you're not going to be able to make batteries if you don't have your materials. So to be able to really look at a kind of modularized approach with plug and play factories to be able to scale to meet demand where our, our partners are is, is very critical in terms of how we meet that supply challenge, how we're able to reduce our, our carbon uh, footprints and, and how we're able to you know, really help to, to build up um, local economies at the same time. So, um, you know, as we think about sustainability and, and batteries, I think the first step is just to take a big picture look, right? If you think, think about uh, what does electrification itself do, which is what we're all aiming to do here, uh, is to drive electrification. You're talking about taking about, you know, depending on what you, statistics you look at, about a quarter of the world's emissions come from the transportation sector. Uh, within that, electrifying vehicles where electrification itself makes an EV is two to four times more efficient by itself compared to an ICE engine car, right? Which is essentially taking gasoline, converting it to uh, the car's energy with a you know 15 to 30% efficiency, whereas electric drive trains, et cetera, are you talking about 77% or so conversion of the electricity into actual power in the car. So taking that sector, and then you take the other sector that's you know tied to this, which is electricity generation itself, which is you know, again, approximately of a quarter of the world's emissions. So you're talking about, about half the world's emissions tied to this electrification aspect. And batteries would also enable more renewable penetration within that electric, electric, electricity generation aspect. So now kind of bringing it back to, well, we're still at only about 6% or so penetration of EVs. So from a sustainability standpoint, what are the technologies that change the game there and uh, essentially allow us to electrify more of transportation faster and drive adoption. And that really comes back to a combination of the, you know, I know you have your poll question out there, but um, it comes back to um, what's the charge time? Can it be as close to a gas station experience as possible? How do we get rid of range anxiety? How do we have charging infrastructure, all of those aspects um, combined? And as we get greater penetration there, then the, the aspects of building the battery supply chain in a more sustainable format, because it's such a nascent industry, it's a fantastic opportunity, right? Whether it's recycling materials, whether it's eliminating materials altogether, right? From, from our perspective, eliminating the anode and the graphite completely from the battery dramatically changes the manufacturing process. Uh, we also get to build from scratch the separator process that we're doing to scale uh, such that we're using earth abundant materials and that are sustainable uh, from the standpoint of uh, sourcing and all of the other aspects. We get to build that. And then even all of us who are working within the battery sector get to figure out what are the best places to put the plants such that they're getting sustainable power to the plant itself so that we're reducing that initial uptick uh, in terms of emissions, in terms of the battery production itself, and then going full life cycle across that half the world's emissions that I, I just described, so. It's interesting. I like the the sort of taking it up another level too and thinking about the whole system. Where, where are we manufacturing? What does the grid look like there? Um, and the point about earth abundant materials is an important one too. And I'm just going to insert one question that we didn't really talk about uh, in advance, but it, we hear a lot about lithium, right? What, what, is, the, what is the state of, of the world's lithium supply? Are we at risk uh, as this electrification boom happens of running into a lithium scarcity? And maybe how do we address it? And I'll take whoever wants to try to answer that question. I can go. I mean, we identify this as one of, of the supply chain risks, and uh, we've been discussing this uh, all, all along. Uh, 
And the, the thing with lithium, it is quite abundant. But that's, uh, it's not an, it's, it is available resource. The challenge is that building out infrastructure for any kind of mining and refining operation, it's time demanding, it requires permits, and it requ requires investments that, you know, making that investment at, at the right point in time in this growing industry, which is a, it's a pretty massive thing to do. So uh, I think that we need, uh, we need to acknowledge that there needs to be more than just factory manufacturing. And we did spend quite a lot of time on it. We invested in a, in a refining uh, company uh, in, uh, in Portugal, here in, um, in Europe that can take multiple sources of, of lithium. But, but of course, I mean, what we also spend a tremendous amount of time on is recycling. And there was a, a sort, sort of a truth uh, back in the days, five years back, that lithium was very difficult to, to recover from a battery. And um, that's, of course, something that needs also to be addressed. I mean, less than 70% uh, of the lithium in a battery is not sufficient to recycle. It's a huge waste. And uh, we are now way, way ahead of that. And I think that developing recycling technologies where you only take into consideration what you think is maybe the uh, low-hanging fruit or maybe the more expensive pieces of a battery, currently uh, lithium is definitely worthwhile uh, refining from in the recycling process, but it was not really like that a few years back. And I think that building a, a recycling strategy for any uh, part of the of the battery industry development is a responsibility that anyone needs to to take. Otherwise, this is not going to be a sustainable uh, transformation of the transportation industry. Yeah, just to add to what Emma's saying, I mean, in terms of, uh, there's no shortage of lithium, but the aspect of the supply chain keeping up with the global demand is a challenge and it's coming online now. I mean, I, I think the, the first world problem we have right now is demand is just tremendous um, across the sector. Therefore, uh, you know, that is going to create innovation and opportunities both for recycling as well as for sourcing uh, lithium from different, um, you know, whether it's uh, mining or other technologies that evolve in order to do so. So we don't really see lithium as a constraint um, for the future, um, getting it right. And uh, whether it's the recycling aspect, rec you know, reclamation, you know, there's companies like Redwood Materials and others who are really focused on that as, as, as well as, uh, as Emma has just described their, their initiatives. So um, but in addition, being able to source it beyond at, from uh, different places, there's a number of mining and other companies in the value chain that are now innovating on that. So, Yeah, I think it really comes down to what is happening with demand and taking it from that kind of perspective. Um, looking at it at the sense of like, oh, this particular material is going to be difficult to get a hold of. Um, I think the reality is that batteries in general are going to be hard to get a hold of to meet demand if we continue on the path that we're on, right? And so that's why you're seeing Revolt. That's why you're seeing, you know, Redwood. That's why we're starting to think about, okay, how are some other ways that we can, you know, start to stave off this tidal wave of demand that's happening and that continues to come um, while we start to, you know, really wrap our heads around the, the challenges of, uh, you know, accelerating our industrialization to, to be able to secure materials. Uh, you know, lithium is easily available. Um, when you look at materials like, for us, silicon and our carbon precursors all over the world, not really a challenge, but you still have to be able to think about it from the, the ultimate deliverable to consumers or to your partners. And, and those batteries, um, we, we're, we're, we're <laughs> We've got quite a challenge just to be able to meet that demand that's coming. And so as we start to think about that, um, one of the fastest issues is, you know, not changing out your factories or your lines or anything to be able to stay up with the demand. And at the same time, starting to scale up new uh, avenues of, 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 of basically inputs, which is through, you know, either recycling or secondary technologies that can come in and help alleviate that burden. 
uh, I think that's what we're really looking at is just this kind of, you know, multifaceted approach to being able to, to meet this demand that's happening right now. Excellent. And maybe one follow-up question uh, for Awesome. I, I know you've mentioned Graphite a couple times in our conversations. Can you maybe just, uh, for, for the audience, dig in a little bit on, on why eliminating Graphite is, is a benefit in some of these batteries? Um, sure. So <clears throat> the way uh, the anode is structured, to, a, a battery, you know, just to give the basics, has the cathode, a separator, and an anode layer in it. And when a battery is charged, the lithium ions move from the cathode through the separator into the anode. Um, you know, one of the analogies I like to use is right now, it's like taking passengers and loading them in a plane in specific seats is the way the lithium ions go into that graphite. For every one lithium ion, it's surrounded by six carbon atoms, um, call it. So A, that takes up space, and B, the ability to move very quickly in and out of that graphite is a challenge because you have to put the lithium ion in a very specific space. And especially as you're pushing up to the, uh, as the battery is getting charged more and more, it gets harder and harder to stick them in specific spots. So um, with our technology, what we're working on is essentially a solid state separator where the lithium plates, much like gold plating or plating any kind of metallic layer as a solid, um, and then essentially you're quickly plating when you're charged and then going through the separator to the cathode. So the advantages of that is you've eliminated all that space that the graphite would take, as well as the speed with which you can move the lithium from the cathode to the anode. Um, and then the other aspect is when you have a solid state separator, um, which has a much higher uh, resistance to heat, et cetera, you also increase the safety um, of the battery. So that's sort of the technology from QuantumScape standpoint that we're trying to bring to market in the next few years. Um, and we've demonstrated at, you know, single layers to 10 layers, all the way up to 16 layers and are building bigger and bigger cells um, and are going to start the automotive qualification process now to bring that to market. Very interesting. Anybody else have anything to add on the, the carbon conversation before we move on? Or the, the graphite, sorry. Well, I think I can add a little bit. Um, I totally agree with what Asim was saying in terms of, you know, graphite takes up 60% of the battery and it doesn't really do a whole lot other than just hold the lithium and then release it. So um, if we can find a way to radically reduce that and, and fill that with more uh, cathode, you immediately have much higher density. If you can also allow for um, a material like, like, you know, it's silicon that is extraordinarily capable of uh, high density and 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 matter and match that with a with a carbon, you get radical fast charging at the same time. And so you start to change what a battery is capable of. Um, and it's really about you know, and the same thing that what you know Austin is talking about, which is eradicating the the biggest kind of loser in the battery, which is graphite. Nice. Um, so uh, just a quick reminder, we do have a poll open if folks want to answer that. Um, and and uh, this this last piece of the conversation sort of gets me to the uh, the maybe the, the little bit of tension we might have in this panel. Right. So a lot of people are eager to sort of pit new technologies against each other. Um, I'm not so much in that camp. I think we're going to need a, a bunch of different technologies to accelerate at the pace we want to here. But um, Talk about maybe a little bit, you know, who your competition is and, and how you sort of how you sort of scale these sustainable higher energy, uh, higher energy dense batteries uh, quickly. Um, and maybe we'll start start with uh, Grant on this one. Um, I think for us, it's really it's graphite. It's still the same thing. It's still looking at, you know, what we've seen work for the past 20 or so years. And we've just really kind of you know, tapped out what the capabilities of that technology are. Um, I don't think that, you know, we tend to think now in terms of like, oh, technology, you know, old iPhone obsolete, new iPhone, new hotness. It doesn't really work that way with batteries. We still use lead acid batteries from decades and decades and decades ago. And that's because they have specific purposes and the demand is just overwhelming. 
So, you know, diversification as a way to meet demand is how we're going to do it. Um, and in that sense, anything that helps us be able to really address this shift to electrification for us is an amazingly good thing. We, we really believe that we're all in this for the same thing. Yeah, I would just very much agree with Grant on that front. I mean, the ultimate competitor at big picture is oil, not really um, other battery techs. Um, you know, of course, we're all striving to bring great technology to the market, but the reality is that if we all execute uh, in terms of our plans and our tech come into market, the demand is so big in terms of the number of gigawatt hour plants built at massive capacities across the world and what's actually needed to go from 6% electrification to even call it 30 to 50%. Um, you know, we would have all have very first row problems of building capacity as we bring our technologies to market. And there are, you know, much like there are different ICE engines today, depending on what kind of vehicle it is or different types of battery tech, as Grant was saying, depending whether it's a stationary or a mobile application, et cetera, there's going to be a tremendous variety of, um, you know, ways to utilize battery technology as we move forward, ranging from consumer devices to stationary storage to EVs. And there's going to be different aspects of various technologies applicable to market segments. Uh, you know, the premium sports car segment may have a different, very different battery uh, requirement compared to long haul trucking, for example. So from from our perspective, uh, it's about, you know, trying to bring the technology to market and executing on the scaling and very much, uh, you know, hoping that the whole ecosystem comes together in terms of the value chains, etc. Um, and if there's some healthy tensions and competitions to have the best tech, great. But at the end of the day, all of the tech is working towards the same goal. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, and this is a similar discussion as we had with renewable energy 10, 15, 20 years back, where everyone wanted to know if wind or solar or what's going to be the right, the right choice in the end. And the same answer as you had, the same that, I mean, anything that competes with, uh, with fossil fuels are welcome into the grid. And just, I mean, getting the infrastructure in place, getting the charging infrastructure, standardizing it on every continent, uh, and then allowing for the chemistries to evolve. I mean, we've been evolving industries. We had a great discussion with um, Professor Yushino uh, when he won the Nobel Prize, uh, and he was here in Sweden, and we discussed on um, you know, did we pick the right chemistry? And he said, I've been developing this for 35, 20, uh, 40 years. And uh, there is a lot of things that will continue developing, of course, around this. And it's going to be a very similar process. But in the end, it's also so that the combustion engines that we see on the streets today, some are on autobahn in 200 kilometers per hour, uh, high speed, and need to perform. And we need batteries for that. We need batteries to to compete on the premium segment. And, but we also need affordable cars for the other segments. So exactly as you said, I mean, uh, th there's gonna be a, a multiple landscape. And honestly, we who are the geeks in this, who loves talking about these chemistries and how the cells are composed and so forth, I think that we assume that there is a wide interest of which chemistry that will be the best one in the end, or which composition of a cell but I think that the most of the people out there, they're more interested in uh, the practical things. Where can I charge? Uh, I mean, if we look at this summer, practical problems for me traveling through Sweden was one, going out of Sweden might not be possible because the passport offices after COVID are swamped. So you can't renew your passport. And secondly, charging infrastructure is really not there. It was two years back. It was three years back, but now, the EV fleet is so big that you actually have to be a little bit smart. You have to be, you cannot charge over lunch because in all the lunch places, it's a queue to get it. <laughs> and uh, people are getting uh, notepads with names uh, in a very formal queue that is, you know, built bottom up. And this needs to be resolved so that um, anyone can charge at any time. 
And this, I think, is what people think about. We think about what chemistry is in the battery, but uh, just getting it there, getting it robust and, and simple for everyone to use, making sure that the grid is uh, fed with renewable energy, and just get this process and this industrial development going. I think that's the most important piece. Very, very well said. I know uh, we have one question in the Q&A, but I would encourage uh, folks to add more. One follow-on question to this discussion. I know ch charging infrastructure, um, especially for these, these uh, EV batteries, is, is a big piece of this conversation. Does anyone have any concern about the future of charging if we're, you know, if we have four, five, six different battery technologies racing against each other, or will they all be able to charge on the same infrastructure? Is there any major changes <laughs> with this new technology in charging? I mean, one is the purely practical thing. And, uh, you know, do we standardize this? And do the, the different car brands talk to each other? Is there, is there a collaboration? Or do we need some kind of authority control? But unless, unless uh, that's a problem, unless that from any competition perspective is a problem, I don't really see a challenge because it's so, it's so manageable by software, um, uh, software integration now and every, everything can be run through the cloud so you can uh, like anyone does today I, I hope and i think is that you can you can tell your car exactly what charging station you're going to and the and the car will tell you if you can charge there how long it will take and how the, the battery needs to be prepared for that kind of charging and i think that as long as that sort of collaboration platform uh, is there and as long as all the car brands or battery maker brands or whatever it is manages to, to, to set this together, I think uh, it will be fully fine. If we talk specifically about the EV fleet, and then of course we have industrial applications and the, and the ESS and all that, but specifically, specifically for EVs, it's in everyone's interest uh, to get that stand price. Yeah, I, d I would say that charging infrastructure interoperability um, you know, is not really the, the key issue. I think where uh, this is going to get really interesting is as our technologies evolve and come to market, thus far the battery itself has been the limitation on how fast your car will charge. How safe is it to charge the battery without causing uh, you know, short circuits through dendrites or other issues that are caused in the battery? Uh, what we hope to do is change the equation where now the charging infrastructure has the challenge of how big of a charging infrastructure can you have so you can charge your car in 15 minutes or less? Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's a nice uh, ecosystem to evolve um, from the standpoint of the battery no longer being the limiting factor, but the enabling factor. Um, and that's, that's our goal, it, you know, in order to do that. Um, and I think you will see charging infrastructure evolve to have larger and larger chargers, um, especially if we hope to get broader penetration right because somebody you know people who are living in apartment complexes multiple dwelling units which is most of the world um need to have the ability to charge fast in and out and those queues that emma mentioned those you know sort of taking your queuing theory well instead of if it's a instead of a 45 minute situation it's a 15 minute situation that really begins to to change the game so yes is there some catching up to do on each side um Absolutely, but I think the demand will dictate that, and we're beginning to see some of the traditional, you know, even gas station companies begin to jump in the game. Um, hopefully, we get more and more of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in the same way that we have uh, multiple companies using batteries from multiple manufacturers from all over the world for consumer electronics, they all plug into and, and charge pretty easy. Uh, and, and we're going to see that in, in, in many cases, we're starting to see that already with EVs, right? But it really comes down to, you know, really being able to meet, you know, what customers ultimately want, which is, you know, how do I get rid of this charge anxiety? How do I stop having to worry about waiting in line? You know, how do I get as, as fast and painless of a charge as possible? And, you know, don't make it cost more than what I'm already paying. If you can make it less, it's even better. So, you know, when we look at you know, how we start to address that from a battery perspective, you know, it's, it's, it goes up to a point where we're like, okay, we can do fast charging. We can do solid, you know, really good density numbers. 
you know, we can get you down to, you know, in some cases, you know, five minutes per every hundred miles, um, kind of like what StoreNet's doing. But ultimately, if you don't have the charging network to, to really be able to supply that, then you're still stuck with the same kind of issues of anxiety about, can I get charged over lunch? You know, am I going to make it, you know, from, from here to, you know, uh, a couple hundred miles away without having to stop and wait for an hour, not because it won't charge fast, but because I'm in an hour long wait for a line. Um, so, you know, as, as I was saying, we're starting to definitely see the more classic large uh, petroleum companies that have infrastructures in place really start to address this from a charging perspective as well. I think the, the challenge is gonna come, uh, at least from what I've seen in some of the last uh, events I've been at is, <laughs> Uh, you know what Emma was pointing to, which is getting everyone to collaborate on this. There's a there's a little bit of a, a still a winner take all approach to to charging, and and I look forward to that starting to you know transition into a, a much more standardized approach. Yeah, I, the the collaboration uh, point is so important because I think it's this this tension of collaboration and healthy competition. <laughs> Um, and I can't remember if it was awesome or Grant mentioned uh, when we chatted earlier about, you know, picking a winner in this space uh, is not really necessary because it's like, it's like a handful of surfers on the entire West coast of the U S right. There's plenty of space for everybody to, to sort of win in this space. Uh, and I think that's a, a really interesting way to put it. Um, if we sort of get back to the, like sort of the strictly sustainability, the classic sustainability point on batteries, one thing I've seen a lot of headlines on over the last year is, you know, what are we going to do with all this solar panel and wind turbine waste when it's done? And, you know, it's only a matter of time before we start to see more and more articles about batteries, right? And Emma, you've, you've addressed it a little bit. I'm curious how the, the technologies your companies are working on can help address that, that, that end of first use for all these batteries and recovering the, the key minerals and the materials. And Emma, since you've already touched on it, maybe you could uh, just elaborate a little bit more on that end of first use story. I love them. This is my favorite topic, as you, of course, understand. Uh, and I'm actually sitting just right next to our big pilot plant uh, for recycling. And, and I mean, the, the thing is, first, I, I really need to point out that in the discussion of first life and second life and what to do next, I mean, we want all the batteries to be on the market as long as, for as long time as possible. So, I mean, that's the number one. It needs to be there. It needs to go to its final, um, to, to, to be utilized in the best way possible and, and also using its entire capacity throughout its lifetime. So, landfilling in some kind of oversized uh, a grid storage application might not be the most sustainable piece since we are also looking at it from a resource perspective as number one. That's number one in recycling for me. It's not actually managing the battery in the, at the end of life. It's actually to make sure that we cap how much resources we need to take out for this transition to bare minimum. So we need to make sure that all across the globe, anywhere where a battery falls, that those minerals are used in the best way possible. So if you look at it from that perspective, you, you, you get into the circularity mode automatically. And, and then the next thing is, of course, yield, to make sure that every atom of that battery becomes a new battery, so that there is no portion of it that is wasted for whatever reason. And that reason can be just swap the technology, but it can also be that it's not valuable enough so that you really spend the effort of making sure that it's recycled. And then the third piece, of course, is to make sure that you recycle it under a fully renewable grid. Because if you replace uh, refining uh, of a uh, virgin material, which is, which is a defini definition, of course, but if you replace that refining and mining with recycling, it might not be necessarily good for the climate uh, unless you, you sort of put that entire recycling under a fully sustainable operation. So it needs to be on a renewable grid. Otherwise, you load the recycling life uh, of the next generation of batteries with a carbon footprint again. 
So that's also super important to remember. It's not relevant for the, the, the sort of reuse of resources. It's more relevant for the carbon footprint. And that's yeah. incredibly important. And then yeah, also, the, of course, the, embodied carbon. the other impact factors. Yeah. Um, with four minutes left, awesome. Grant, anything to add to that, that end of first use sort of recycling? Yeah, I think from us, it definitely goes much to what Emma's talking about from a process perspective. So what are you doing about abatement? What are you doing about heat capture? How are you using those to be able to, to continually power your, your facilities and your factories? So that you know, even as you're <coughs> developing you know, materials to go into new batteries, you know, much less recycled batteries, that you're still already able to pull as little off the grid as you possibly can. So that when they you know, then go into recycling, it's it's still a, it's a further reduction, and I think I think process innovation has a as a, a, a there's a there's a wide wide field of opportunity there to to be addressed. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in wild agreement with all of the points made, but the, the other aspect I would just say is that the robustness of the battery itself, ma making sure that the materials you do use last for the longest time possible. So, for example, we look at 800 cycles as sort of the, uh, you know, basic test of at least retaining 80% of the capacity of the battery. Well, what that means is if you're talking about well over 300 to 500 miles, call it, that's 240,000 to 300,000 miles, like making the battery itself, whatever input you've made to make the battery last much, much longer than today's batteries, you're sort of increasing the size of that circle and then you're looking at, well, what can I do with it when it has 80% capacity? Do I, is there a way to get really high yield by recycling or is there a secondary use? But from the get go, having performance parameters and standards that are far more robust than today's lithium ion would give you a big sustainability advantage in that circular aspect of the sustainability. I love, yeah. I love the idea. I love the idea of the battery lasting longer than the car, right? Like the car falling apart around the battery. <laughs> um, well, that's cool. Like how do you take the 100,000 mile car and turn it to a 200,000 mile car? Exactly. Um, we do have one question. Uh, we only have two minutes left, so I'm going to take whoever wants to answer this first. But somebody in the Q&A asks, assuming the battery transportation is not simply a bridging technology and also assuming that hydrogen power is a potential source of transportation uh, energy, how does battery power compare with or sort of compete with hydrogen power? Uh, this actually came up a little bit in the um, long haul trucking session just earlier. Folks want to watch that and, and weren't able to attend. But, you know, sort of it, it, do you see a space for both um, as one bridging is one sort of long term? Where, where do you guys fall on this answer of hydrogen versus versus batteries? I still think it goes back to like diversifying and taking in everything you possibly can, right? Uh, everything is going to have a, a certain fit in the same way that Asim was talking earlier. You know, some things are going to be really great for Porsche. Other things are really going to be really good for like Freightliner. Uh, and they may not necessarily be the same. And, you know, in the end, what we're really looking for is, is still, you know, how do we reduce our, our need off of fossil fuels? How do we make sure that our processes are as clean as possible? And, and, and how do we make sure that, you know, we work to do that as quickly as possible across the entire range of, uh, of opportunities? So I wish we had more time, but we are out of time. I'm going to give everybody 15 to 20 seconds really quickly to wrap up. If you have one more thing you want to say, let's start with you, Awesome. Um, I would just say, look, uh, well, QuantumScape, we're literally at the beginning in terms of introducing the innovation that we're trying to bring to market. But at the same time, it is probably the most exciting time to be in the market, uh, just given, I don't think 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we started the company, we could have predicted the kind of demand that exists today for all of our respective technologies. So very exciting times and looking forward to, you know, making this circular sustainability or life a reality so yeah. great emma yeah i i mean i think that i'm now in the storage i just wanted to show some of the batteries that we got in so it, i would like to encourage everyone to just get their hands dirty i mean regardless of if it's range stress or if it's starting a new business and you're super scared and you don't know if the funds are there or what's happening to the financial market or just getting your own ev and try it out 
you know, we all need to jump into the game because when everyone does, uh, then it's going to change. Then the movement starts. And getting your hands dirty is a responsibility now. Awesome. Thank you. Grant, one, one more final word? I, I, I totally agree. Everything is just, it's, it's changing rapidly. And the, the best thing to do is to come play with us. Because what's happening with how we're transitioning energy is, you know, it definitely feels like that sense of when we you know, started really thinking about the, the industrial revolution at its beginning, and we're starting to, uh, we're entering a new area. So, you know, come play. Awesome. Well said, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, please jump over to the keynotes. They're going to be great. Uh, complete the survey. Thanks to our panelists. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Pleasure having you. Thank you so much.